when we talk about uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, the first thing one has to know is that uh, when an aneurysm ruptures, the bleeding takes place into the subarachnoid space and not into the brain parenchyma. Here are some facts about subarachnoid hemorrhage. Of course, uh, we know that it is blood in the subarachnoid space and not within the parenchyma itself. But the important fact to know is uh, when a patient has a uh, ruptured aneurysm, about 15% of these patients will never reach the hospital alive. Another 40 to 50% will be dead in the next one week unless and until the aneurysm is secured. And uh, about 50% uh, will be dead in the first six months. What we're trying to emphasize is subarachnoid hemorrhage is not a medical condition and it needs to be treated aggressively because most of them are ruptured aneurysms and if aneurysms are not treated they will rupture again. Now look at this graph. It shows us that about 70% of the patients who have subarachnoid hemorrhage have an underlying aneurysm that is ruptured. The rest of the 30% is formed by AV malformations, an intracerebral hematoma that is extended in the subarachnoid space or a small group where we cannot find a finding at all and these are usually a small perimesencephalic bleeds. Thus it's of paramount importance that every attempt is made to rule out an aneurysm when a patient comes to us with subarachnoid hemorrhage because aneurysms are treatable conditions and if not treated they are prone to rupture again in the next uh, few days and weeks. Now when we talk about aneurysm we must remember that 70 percent of the aneurysms are in the anterior circulation. Close to 30 percent will be seen in the region of the anterior communicating artery. Around the same amount will be aneurysms that are seen in the internal carotid artery. It could be in the region of the posterior communicating, in the region of the ophthalmic, in the cavernous segment and all put together we are talking somewhere around 30 to 35. The middle cerebral artery bifurcation would contribute to another around 15 to 20 percent and the rest of them will be seen in the posterior circulation. Now why is it important? It just makes us understand where to search for as we do an evaluation for uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is a little animation that will give you an idea as to what really happens. A vessel that looks normal will develop a small outpouching at an area that is weak. This in some people will be stable and does not change at all. But in another group of people this will enlarge at times develop a daughter aneurysm which is an extremely weak spot which can rupture. Or when an aneurysm ruptures the body mechanism takes over immediately producing a cap which will be uh, organized blood. Now in some people this can happen instantaneously especially if the bleed uh, the rupture is small and these people survive. Now if this body mechanism is delayed or if the rupture is large people may never reach the hospital alive. But this is not safe. The clot can lice once again in the next few days leading to a second bleed which is often fatal. That is the reason we emphasize that aneurysms should be treated and not left for nature to take care because like we mentioned it can re-bleed and it can be fatal. If you take a CT in the acute phase when a patient comes with severe headache which we call um, uh, of a thunderclap headache which is a kind of headache with a patient never experienced. Now in this patient a CT will show a white blood in the subarachnoid space. Now if you take the CT four to five days later it may look isodense and to the brain and we may miss it altogether. So if there is a strong clinical suspicion of subarachnoid hemorrhage then the thing would be to do a lumbar puncture but at times an MR can pick up blood because what looks isodense on CT will appear hyperdense on T1 sequence. 
Once you have a patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage, what are the investigations that we can do to uh, pick up this aneurysm we were talking? MRA and CTA both are reasonably accurate. We can come to an accuracy rate low, uh, coming towards 90%. But it's still DSA and 3D rotational angiography which is the one investigation that can give us all the answers. In our center, we still start as a 3D DSA as a first line of uh, investigation after an SAH rather than going through uh, CT and MR. But definitely, they are both investigations which can be used to aneurysm. Now, here is a picture of an angiogram and it shows uh, an aneurysm which is at the anterior communicating artery and the other one is a 3D angio which shows it even better. The advantage of a 3D is you can rotate it, you can spin it, you can see it in all angles, you can make measurements and the end of the day it gives you all the information you would need to plan therapy. So what are the treatment options we have when we treat a patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage? One, identify and treat the causing lesion so that it doesn't happen again. Treat hydrocephalus if the patient develops hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus can develop either because of an aqueduct obstruction or because of absorption of CSF being hampered. And then of course treating vasospasm which often is easier said than done. Now this is how a ruptured aneurysm would look like in a vessel and uh, the conventional treatment for aneurysms has always been surgery. Now what does one do in surgery? One would dissect, come to the aneurysm and with an applicator place a clip precisely across the neck. Now this one is uh, probably still the most robust form of treatment and still continues to be the dominant player in the uh, world of aneurysm surgery and we will talk a little more about this a little later. Now what are the problems? Why is it that we just couldn't say let us settle down with surgery? One, it carries a significant risk in the first few days because the vessel is friable and uh, unless the surgeon has a lot of experience you can have a rupture even during surgery. It cannot be done from day 5 to day 14 because that is a period of peak spasm and this is a dangerous period. When you do a surgery during this period, we may provocate further spasm. Then if you got a lot of comorbid conditions, diabetics, hypertensives, the risk is higher. And of course, if the patient is old, about 70, uh, you find that the results are not good. And then in a clinical grading is poor, a patient is unconscious and uh, who's got large uh, uh, motor deficits or neurological deficits, all of these are candidates whose outcomes are not excellent with surgery. And thus, we are, the world was searching for another alternative. So thus came the concept of doing a procedure, uh, which is minimally invasive, which is done uh, through a catheter called endovascular coiling. And the ISAT study, which is international subarachnoid hemorrhage trial was a trial which compared endovascular procedures versus open surgery and as you look at the slide you can understand they could conclusively prove that endovascular coiling was a safer option than open surgery for people with a ruptured aneurysm. Uh, so we will be talking a little bit now on endovascular treatment in the next lecture which is part 2. So uh, we understood the concept, we understood the danger, we understood why it should be investigated, we knew the basics of surgery and now we talk about uh, the minimally invasive form or the endovascular treatment.